even if it's 5,000 or 10,000, is really key for the stability of our country. But coming back to the, uh, their presence uh, and the impact on women's rights particularly, I think if it helps the stability of the country and the region, it will help um, the, uh, the protection of, of human rights uh, in general, but in particular of women's rights. It has the impact on, on overall situation in Afghanistan. So I think we do need them. And the second argument that I will make is the job in Afghanistan is not completed. They should not leave Afghanistan when they have not finished their job. So I know you've worked a lot with education in the country, and I was wondering how ideas such as peace, tolerance, or even feminism are being promoted in the schools maybe to promote future stability in the country. Um, I think education itself brings, give a lot of confidence and a lot of capability to the people to, to be more tolerant, to be more acceptable to me, to be more respectful to principles and values of human rights. Uh, so that is generally something that we do. But in terms of uh, a promotion of human rights in Afghanistan, I would say that we, compared to the region, we are doing much, much better because of the existence of the Human Rights Commission, because of the strong support on human rights values. Um, the work that the Human Rights Commission does in Afghanistan None of our neighboring country has such an institution. So um, this is a national institution, and our job is promotion and protection of human rights. So um, it does uh, help a lot. And it turned to be this course within the families in very remote part of Afghanistan. Before, I mean, 13 years ago, using the word human rights was counted as a crime. Now they are talking in remote areas, uh, among the families, on human rights. Before, if there was uh, a, a woman who, a girl who was raped or sexually abused by anyone, the family was trying to, to kill her and bury her with the you know, so-called, all the shame that bring to the family. But now, from very conservative families, they're coming up to Kabul and they're um, advocating for justice. I mean, I, we had a case in Kunduz from a um, nomad family, very conservative family. Um, their daughter was raped. And this man came with his daughter to our office and said that, I don't care if all the television interview me and show me in my daughter, because I want to be seen in order to be, to be a lesson for uh, for other people. And my daughter should be shown in television in order to protect the other girls, not to be faced in the same way. We were able to bring those criminals in just, to justice and to, they got already their punishment, 18 years, so 16 years of imprisonment. So there is a lot of change within the Afghan society. So the Women's Law Association at Maine Law screened a documentary um, that featured you um, in anticipation of your arrival. And one thing that, that stood out to me um, in the documentary was that um, many women's hospitals were, were forced to close down by the Taliban. And I was wondering, um, what was the philosophical reasoning behind that? And how did you, as a medical doctor by training, deal with that situation? Um, well, we, we don't have a lot of women's hospital in Afghanistan, but uh, with Taliban mentality, they said that the woman cannot go to a male doctor. So they, um, one of the hospitals in Kabul, with a, which was a general hospital, was turned to be a woman hospital, and of course the maternity hospital is naturally for women, so luckily or unluckily, we are responsible for that. Uh, so, but hospitals in different provinces 
they have a small section of maternity. So it was not a really a, a, a woman hospital. Only in Kabul we have a maternity hospital. Um, but it was really difficult. We didn't have enough uh, female doctors and female staff. And it was quite difficult for women. But still, the people were going to, to find their ways. Um, I have to say that it is, it's a still a big problem because if you look at the flights every day between Kabul and Delhi uh, in India, it's every day almost five flight or six flight between Kabul and India. And 80 percent of those flights are patients who go to India for treatment. Uh, when I was a student, we had a center uh, for radiotherapy for cancer cases. And currently, we don't have a radiotherapy center in Afghanistan, imagine, for 30 million people. We're still lacking behind a lot on, on those issues, but we're trying to catch up and, and do. Dr. Samar, thank you for coming to Maine. We appreciate having you here. Um, my question is relating to economic development in Afghanistan at large. Um, in particular, um, you mentioned the sort of dependence on, um, on sort of the war economy in terms of the translators. Um, also, it seems like in terms of funding, you've had to reach out to the international women's rights community. Um, I think you mentioned the feminist majority quite a bit. So what I'm interested in is how do you get to economic, um, uh, the picture of economic success in Afghanistan without um, dependence on aid or dependence on external funding? Um, what are some glimmers of hope that you see, um, in particular, um, given the brain drain that has happened over the last 50 years in your country? Um, do you see people returning after, um, after this removal of troops? Um, and also, um, what about women's empowerment in terms of entrepreneurial projects? Are those kinds of things coming up? Is there even possible without education? Mm -hmm. um, sorry, this is a lot of, no, a lot of questions. Okay. But um, also, um, ICT, is that something that is important? Uh, communication technology, is that something that you actually can see people using and utilizing to um, improve the, the economy in, in, in your home country? Um, yes, it's a good question, I think. Um, I think one of the problem is that um, the basic infrastructure was not existing in the country. Uh, we still face a lot of problem on that. But we do have a lot of natural resources in the country. But what I keep saying that we we have gold, we have uranium, we have rare rare earth, something that um, I think it's very precious and expensive. We have a lot of iron, we have a lot of copper, we have gold in the country, we have iron, uh, we have oil and gas. But the problem is that we do not have the infrastructure, we do not have the security that the companies could come. So hopefully we will be better off by uh, beginning those trillions that we have underground uh, to help the economy in the country. But you are right that we, we are still um, functioning with war economy, including the production of opium in Afghanistan, because we are still the largest although a lot of money, a lot of effort were spent to reduce opium, every year we get more than, um, than the previous year. Um, I think it does require strong political will, um, I believe, on reduction of opium, and replace the opium with some other uh, better livelihood for the people. Because when the people grow wheat, they cannot feed their family because the wheat that we grow is much more expensive than the wheat which has come from our neighboring countries or providing by United Nations, WFP, or some other NGOs. So it is, it is not affordable to 
the small farmers to grow wheat. And we need to introduce another livelihood for them. So we hope that we, uh, there's an um, encouragement to grow saffron to replace opium, but it does require more stronger political will to push for it. And of course, a lot of law enforcement. And, and that's why we keep saying that um, it is a problem, and I hope that there will be a proper multi-dimensional strategy in order to get Afghanistan out of that those problem. And I would say that it's not only Afghanistan Afghan problem, it is international mafia and a problem for everybody. It might not reach a lot in, in the US, but it, it, re it goes. There's a market for opium, unfortunately. Uh, so uh, that's why I, I lobby and I keep saying that um, Afghanistan should not be isolated once again. Uh, uh, because with the technology that the people has access today to, uh, we will be more destructive. Uh, by saying this, that if you look at all the um, terrorist activities around the world, in, in New York, in Washington, in, in Madrid, in London, uh, there's no Afghan terrorists among them. But most of them has been trained in Afghanistan. So we are punished because of the other people coming to our country. So that is, uh, um, that's why I, I say that it requires united, multi-dimension strategy to improve the situation, general situation in Afghanistan, including the economy. And improvement of economy, reduce the violence, and reduce the um, terrorist activity and mafia group in Afghanistan. Okay, so um, changing the law is a significant step in achieving women's rights, but I also believe that there needs to be some cultural shift in attitude um, for the treatment of women, and I was just wondering if any steps are being taken in order for that aspect to be fulfilled. Yes, you're right that the the changing the law is one part of the job, but uh, to implement the law and make it reality for the people is the important part. But I think those could come through education. That's why I emphasize on education, but on quality education. Not only the children to go to school and spend only two hours in school and then come back. It should be a real um, commitment to improve the quality of education also. And that would come with good education. And I hope that um, the people will support us uh, with improving the quality of education also, not only the number. Uh, in my view, the number of this is matter, of course. But the quality of education is also an important element to change the mentality of the people in the country and to enforce the law. So one of the issues that the culture of impunity should stop, uh, should be stopped in Afghanistan, and it should be law enforcement for everybody. So the nepotism and corruption and, and all these things has to, to be reduced in the country. Asalaamu Alaikum. Uh, my question is foreseeing Afghanistan's future. Whatever Karzai did in the last 13 years, I think he did a good job. Particularly the issues that you and I are aware among ethnicity issues and the chaos that exists in Afghanistan. I want you to answer a question, what are you going to do to bring the women from diverse background since they have a common issues? And I also want to know the future of Afghanistan after 2014. There are former ministers, warlords, such as Ismail Khan, preparing for a civil war, literally gathering up his gang, preparing for a civil war. Should we be scared of that? Or do you think that the election will take place? Uh, that's another question. My last question. Uh, is probably Peter can answer this question. 
since regarding law. The United States did not need a bilateral agreement to go to Afghanistan and conquer or whatever they did. Why do we need bilateral agreement now if we didn't need a bilateral agreement 13 years ago? And is Karzai doing the right thing not to sign? Eventually it will be signed. What is Karzai's point of view on this? Thank you. Uh, well, I think the um, problem among the ethnic group in Afghanistan will exist as long as the people are not educated, as long as the people think that this ethnicity is um, better than the other ethnicity. I think the, uh, that's why we are promoting human rights that um, doesn't matter which color you are, doesn't matter where you're born, doesn't matter what, how big is the size of your eye or your nose, but your dignity is important as a human being and everybody should really respect that, that values. And it really matters everywhere uh, in, Af in Afghanistan, including Afghanistan. Um, that is one of the issues that we should promote, and I, my fight with the Ministry of Education is that we don't have to go on detail of different religious religion. What we need to go and do to promote rights in Afghanistan, if we say that every child has the right to access to quality education, it is, doesn't matter Pashto or Persian or Hazara or Uzbek, every child has the right to have a quality education. Uh, if we say that everybody as a human being has the right to uh, clean water, it's common for everybody and we promote equality, we promote um, the rights among the people, then the people realize, okay, I'm a Hazara, so my neighbor is Pashtun, my, the other neighbor is Uzbek. Everybody has the right to clean water. So we are not there yet because the curriculum writing is, is a long process. Uh, but we are promoting that. The second uh, question that you uh, asked about Ismail Khan, I don't think he will be able to go back to the civil war. I think what he does, Ismail Khan and people like Ismail Khan does, is try to keep the recognition that they have trying to survive, in my view. That's why they're fighting. I, I keep telling them that uh, once I was, uh, I was arguing with the, the president and I said, if you see the two boys fighting in the street, the one who has the uh, physical power, he just punch, and the other one who doesn't have, and he began shouting talking about the father and the mother, and the eyes. I don't know about the ethnicity and religious and the size of nose and eyes. So we better have to have the physical power to punch someone rather than shouting. So please stop shouting too much. So that is my, uh, my argument that I think these people try to survive and keep their position. And, and it's not easy what they say I don't think the people in Afghanistan would go back to civil war. I don't believe on it, personally, and, and the people will not go. The third question was on uh, BC. I, think, I don't know, I don't understand why, why the president does that. Because it is part of the strategic partnership. It's not something new. And um, the other, whoever take the power, in election in Afghanistan, will sign. They already said that they will sign. And there's a need. Like Ashraf Ghani was part of the negotiation. And Zalmay Rasul, who's another um, front runner, was also part of the negotiation as foreign minister. Dr. Dr. Abdullah already announced that he will sign it. So there's no, uh, this three is the front runner, the others are not really uh, make a, even the South Sayaf is clearly saying that we need this. Um, 
But I think you know the culture in Afghanistan that they want to be brave and they want to be a good leader. They, don't, uh, they, uh, they do not want to submit that they are powerless. So that is part of our bravery. We, we are claiming that we are brave when we are distracted. Uh, sorry, this is, <laughs> this is our nature. <laughs> I think because we are living in the mountain, maybe that's part of the <laughs> people who live in the mountain. It's part of our nature. Um, yes, I don't know who. <coughs> How long we can go, I think. Uh, somebody has to. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I'm willing to, to answer a question, but... Uh, ten, more minutes. ten more minutes, okay. Uh, then short question, easy question, and I will <laughs> answer <laughs> shortly, sh or short answers. Um, so I was just wondering about your views of um, how the, the problems around um, uh, women's rights in Afghanistan are portrayed in the international media. Um, I feel like sometimes... I don't know if there's a contradiction between it, but um, I feel like, especially in the U.S., maybe um, they sort of the more victimized side of the problem is um, is put forth, and of course that's really powerful and um, and necessary to like reveal the problem. But I was just wondering if you think that because kind of the goal is um, em empowerment in the long run, if um, talking more about the problems and not as much about the solutions is the right way to go about it, or if you think that um, that the media should be focusing on other parts of the problem or the solutions? Um, I think the concept, the uh, the bad news is is, uh, is a news for the media, unfortunately, not only about Afghanistan and about everywhere. So Afghanistan is in the media when we have suicide attack. Afghanistan is in the media when the nose of a woman cut. I think women are killed everywhere and women are raped everywhere, unfortunately. I mean, we see very uh, uh, bad cases in every part of the world. It's, uh, it's a human nature. But of course, it differs in the, on the level of education and the level of law enforcement and the level of uh, economical situation of the country and so on. Uh, um, but unfortunately, media always shows the bad side of Afghanistan and we are not that bad. We are bad, but not that bad. Um, we are aggressive, uh, we are violent, but it's not all the people. It's not all the people, it's, it's a group of people. Um, on the issue that uh, of um, acknowledgement of the problem, I think on the we cannot deny the problem because we, then we will not go to find a solution for it. I keep saying that we should acknowledge the problem which exists in Afghanistan and make plan according to the uh, reality and the condition in the ground. And based on that, we can make our policy strategy for improvement of the situation. So I think we have to mention those problems also. But we have to mention the successes in Afghanistan also. Um, OK, so oh, that's loud. Um, so you were talking about how sort of the people need to elect and sort of change their own future. And the young women or the girls, uh, the future, the, the generation, the new generation now, will be the ones handling the situation in the years to come. And although they are, you know, living, of course, a, a very troubled life and have, have seen terrible things, they haven't seen the sort of also prolonged terrors that, that you or people like you who have been handling the situation for a, a long time or have been living long enough to see all those, all those, all those, horrible things, they have not seen them t uh, as much to the extent, I don't think, of the sort of prolonged terror. And how do you think they're going to handle, how do you think they'll fare in the years to come? Or how do you think they're going to, how do you think the situation will be handled um, once they're in charge and handling the situation? Uh, well, I hope that the situation will be much better because the young generation, the people in your age, haven't seen a lot of violence. So they... Uh, they, uh, they have access to education, they have access to internet and a lot of information, and their mentality will change. 
and I think as a human being, you like to live in peace. That's also your nature, beside being aggressive, but you also want to have freedom. And that is coming slowly. We see more boys and girls who are getting education and who believes on, on these basic rights. And I, uh, I was talking to a group of young boys and I said that, please don't try to, to follow your father's step. Because your father is thinking differently and don't follow your father. And I keep telling to the girls that you don't follow your mothers because our mothers, my mother, for example, was uneducated. So I should not follow her step. And my daughter's, uh, the generation gap between me and my daughter, she should not follow my step. She is in this uh, new globalization and new technology, so she should be much better than I do, than I am. So I think uh, we are hopeful with the young generation. Hopefully, they we will have uh, strong young boys and girls who resist against violence and discrimination. Please. Um, you've mentioned several times how important educating the young generation is. I'm wondering what sort of things um, are changing culturally um, to influence the attitudes of um, uh, c current adults, people who are making decisions and um, the ones to be doing that uh, educating of children. Um, I think it depends on the on their own mentality, because um, in my view, uh, women's rights or um, freedom generally is a political issue. So some people try to re reduce the freedom of the people in order to control them. It doesn't matter men or women, but this is also, unfortunately, the human nature. That's why we, um, in a lot of countries, we change the law uh, and try to have our own rule and regulation. Uh, so I think that will change a lot with the uh, current uh, situation that we have around the world. And we, c we cannot predict where we go because it's a lot of